I'm Mewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over and Esmeralda Santiago. I'm so happy to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be able to talk to you about literature. <laughs> oh, Las Madres, this new novel. And we're going to talk about Conquistadora too. But I want to start for a second with when I was Puerto Rican, because that was a Discover Great New Writers pick. The old Barnes & Noble program, we have a new version of that program now. But the old Discover Great New Writers program tapped you in 1993 when the book came out. That's right. Fans of yours for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I've been a great fan of Barnes & Noble also, even before that. Uh, you were my local bookstore, so I was able to go to my my neighbors actually got to see oh wow she lives in our community right i love that <laughs> i love that so much las madres though is a new novel which i knew it was coming i didn't know exactly when it was coming i am very glad i got to read it and i'd love to talk about these women and i'm going to ask you to explain who las madres are Okay. And then we'll get to the daughters in a second, but let's start with Las Madres themselves. Uh, okay. There's um, three, there's two generations uh, in this book. Uh, there's Shirley, who's 70 years old, born in Maine, but her mother is from Puerto Rico. And so she has been to Puerto Rico and has a lot of relatives in Puerto Rico and, and is bilingual. Her partner is Ada. Ada, who is a little bit younger than her, and she was actually born and raised in Puerto Rico. And when they get together, Ada moves to um, Maine with Shirley, with their daughter, Graciela, who is much younger, obviously. And uh, Graciela also is raised in Maine and Puerto Rico, going back and forth. The two mothers, and then there's Luz. Luz is a young woman that we meet at the very beginning that um, is a friend and becomes really almost like a sister to Shirley and Ada. Luz also has a daughter called Marisol. So there's Shirley, Ada, Luz, and then there's the two daughters, Graciela and Marisol. I really like these women a lot. I really, <laughs> really like these women. And Luz has a very sort of complicated story. She has a brain injury. And yes. I'm not really giving anything away because honestly, it happens very early. Her parents are killed in a car crash and she's left with a brain injury. And this is 1970... 75 when the okay. accident takes place. Okay. And 76, 76 when she's more recovered and okay. able to uh, function. And I thought that was an incredibly interesting choice for you to make as the writer. Brain injury is something that I think people know exist. But they don't think about it, and certainly not when it comes to teenagers and not when it comes to being back in the world, right? Like, I think right. we have this idea that brain injury either leaves you entirely incapacitated and you can't speak and you can't find it. And here's this teenager who now no longer has dance. Mm -hmm. She's got these sort of, do we call them seizures? What do we, what do we call her episodes? They, uh, it's this association episodes uh, is one of the, medical terms for it so she doesn't have any physical manifestation she doesn't shake or you know it's not a seizure it's more it happens in her brain so it's completely different yeah and the people who know her know that this happens and they know the signs to look for and they talk about yeah you know what is quite going on but you know it's hard enough to be a teenager right and then on top of it you have a brain injury this is right this is a lot and i'm wondering if you knew as you sat down to write, because it's been a minute since Conquistadora, right? Like it's been over a decade. It, it's been over a decade. And actually, when I was at the very end of the writing of Conquistadora, I had a stroke. And I believe that Las Madres begins with my experience during that process of recovery and, and a stroke is considered a kind of brain injury. I think that sense, one of the things that I have never forgotten from the stroke that I had was that there was no muscle involvement. I didn't, my face didn't freeze up or physically I was, I looked fine. And so many people said to me, you don't look like you've had a stroke. And yet I knew that I'd had a stroke inside. 
And so I think that um, this is the beginning of my thinking about what is it like for somebody who's actually living with something like this and uh, it, there's no visible visible way for people to identify it, but what does it feel like for you as a person going through it? Uh, and then it just went a little bit further than I had planned because when I begin to to think about this character being a young woman and a ballerina and a very accomplished and popular young girl, there's, you know, you just lose so much. Um, I, I was already a 60-year-old woman. I had had a whole life before. Um, but what happens when this uh, young person has no idea? She only has those few years and only what she remembers from them. So so that's where I be, that germ uh, begins to grow. You have a couple of different points in the novel where you talk about Luz actually being a fiction of herself and also having yeah. no idea of selfhood. And it's a really interesting idea to play with in a novel because you're crossing time, you're covering character development as well. And you have a character who really, it kind of takes unreliable narrator to a different level even though this is third person a close third person story this is not narrating her own story but i love all of the things that you do with the narrative so i have to ask because you're cutting back and forth between 1976 and 2017 that's right you've got a really tight cast of these five women now granted there are some other folks this is grandma we will come back to this is grandma (laughs) And Warren, who's the nicest man in the world? We'll come back to Warren, too. And Cousin Oliver. (laughs) There's so many nice people in this book. It's really (laughs) terrific. I mean, there's some horrible people, too. But the nice ones outweigh the horrible people. Are you sitting down to map this out? I mean, it's very different when you're writing essays that form a memoir. Right. But you're making this up as you go along. You have had a brain injury yourself. But also, you're covering a lot of ground. In Puerto Rico's history, in America's history, because, you know, Puerto Rico is a colony. Like, we need to talk about all of this. All that stuff. Well, you know, in a way, I think she, Luz, is the the avatar for me and millions of of people who have left their homes for whatever reason. Uh, In her case, she has that very particular and uh, specific reasons. but. I think that it, it, a lot of her experiences, you don't have to have had a brain injury to disassociate when you're from one culture, another different language, different climate, different uh, physical environment. It's, it's not very, very hard to imagine that one then goes to the new environment and you feel completely, you don't know who you are anymore. Um, and so I think that that, for Luz, she really represents a lot of these um, experiences that that I've had, that so many people that I know who are in my life and people that I've met and I've talked to about this sense that you you know who you are, but you don't know who you are. <laughs> you know, you see the mirror, you see a person, somebody else sees somebody completely different, uh, and depending on whether they are kind and open or are closed off and ignorant or uninformed or whatever one wants to call it. You still are, um, there's a Spanish word, which I really love. It's lidiar. It's you're trying to manage everything that's happening around you at the same time. Sometimes you um, you fail at doing it all. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's really impossible sometimes. I think that that's where this whole um, idea came with Luz is to represent an experience that, uh, in her case, she has a brain injury. In the case of the tens of thousands of people that I've met in in my long life, you don't need to have gone through that to have an experience like it. And I believe that you know having my stroke gave me that concept or that realization in my own life. And I just wanted to make it real for other people and for other readers. Oh, you did. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> that is exactly what you did. In this book. 2017 is a very deliberate choice on your part. I think some listeners will remember that Puerto Rico was hit 
by two very vicious hurricanes sort of within a two-week period, wasn't it? It was within uh, less than 10 days. There was a hurricane that um, was coming, was coming. Everybody prepared. Everyone was really scared because it had been a long time since there had been a very, very powerful one like that. And Irma uh, actually skirted the island, uh, just went north and east and then went directly somewhere else into the Atlantic and then did damage in other places, but didn't do as much damage as people in Puerto Rico expected. But it was still a lot of damage. (laughs) Yeah, Culebra and Vieques, which are two other islands in the archipelago to the east of the big island, they were completely devastated. So when uh, Maria comes a few days later, there were two strains of thought that, that the residents had. Ones were like, oh, you know, I, I prepared for Irma, I had water, I had this, I had that. And then it just went away. That's what's going to happen. I'm not going to pay attention to Maria too much. And then there were the uh, there were the people who actually experienced what happened with Irma uh, in the, really the third east of the island, particularly very, very much affected. And those people were much more thoroughly prepared and scared. Within a few hours of Maria hitting Puerto Rico, the entire grid kaput, you know, and everyone is now, uh, Puerto Ricans who have experienced uh, storms that know that this happens quite often. And, um, but in this case, it was months and months and months and months, and there are places that are still not connected on the island. So it was a devastating um, event. Uh, It was a historical event. I was in New York at Mm, the time. Yeah. I was, I'm Warren. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, I can imagine. Panicking. Yeah. <laughs> and spending, you know, every waking hour um, trying to get information because I have relatives on the island. Um, mm-hmm. I have many, many friends. And of course, this is the place where I was born and where I was raised. And so there's all this uh, emotion as uh, someone who is not there, but knowing what's going on and how awful it is and knowing that they on the island don't know how awful it is uh, unless the people who are getting rattled around by the storm. So there was a lot that I I, I really wanted to to express about that experience. Um, and, you know, and I really went back and forth where it's the story about these people being in the United States panicking and worrying the way I was. And at a very, very early stage of the writing, I said, no, I've got to, I've got to put these characters in the middle of the storm. And you did. (laughs) Oh, you did. And I understand exactly why you did it. I had some moments of thinking, okay, I'm going to trust Esmeralda because she's Esmeralda Santiago. But I did have some moments. I will say though, structurally, It's a great way to talk about class. It's a great way to talk about access. It's a great way to talk about privilege. I mean, I love Marisol. I love Graciela. They are great women. Although you had to put her in Maine. (laughs) I say this as someone who spent quite a lot of time in Maine (laughs) as a child. And I was like, okay, so you made her first and only in a lot of rooms. Poor Gracia. (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I suppose we could argue that she passes more than some, but, yes, you know, her well, moms, you put everyone isolated in Maine, everyone else gets to be Maine. in the Bronx. <laughs> well, there's a reason. There's a I know, reason I know. Uh, and I'm going to ask you I, what I that owned reason a house. Was. <laughs> <laughs> I owned a little cottage okay. in Maine um, for 30 plus years. Okay. Okay. That's where I wrote all my books. And I have always wanted to write about this little community that I, I adored this place. It's just a fishing community. And, and the people there were so kind and open and generous mm-hmm. and wonderful. And so I've always wanted to to write about this. And I have to tell you, I wrote a lot more about that place that didn't make it into the book, maybe in another book. Okay. But, um, but, it, but at a very, very early stage, again, when Shirley appears to me, um, she just said to me, I, I was born in Maine. I'm, I'm a Puerto Rican who was born in Maine. And Graciela is a Puerto Rican who is raised in Maine. And what was that like? Well, it was, it was me being in this very small community 
at the beginning being really probably the darkest <laughs> a more exotic looking person in this place. They were all very descendant of, uh, you know, Scottish and Irish and, and Vikings, probably, who knows, and much more stoic than I am. I'm very exuberant and out there. So there was a lot, um, there was a lot for me to explore about um, what my culture in Puerto Rico mm-hmm. is and the culture that surrounds uh, Graciela and Ada, who was born in Puerto Rico. I just, again, you know, I think you, you, you hit it when you said you're talking about class and, and privilege and passing, if, mm, if that's yep. the word for, for, for Graciela, who, who is very conscious of mm-hmm. her Puerto Rican-ness. She speaks right. the language. She has visited the island many, many times. Uh, and yet she loves this place. She worked in a lobster boat with her grandpa, you know, and so she she is a Puerto Rican who is not like the Puerto Ricans that most people have met. And that's what I wanted to, I, I really want to explore also Puerto Rican-ness beyond the stereotype or let's say the familiar for people, you know, none of these people were, uh, none of these women are performers or boxers, or sports figures, you know, they are an accountant and a nurse and, and, and a teacher and they're regular people uh, who happen to share this culture and this history. And, and that was very important to me. They're also American citizens. And they are. Yeah, yes. let's not lose sight of this. Like they are, <laughs> this, We're not talking about an immigrant story. We are talking about a cross-cultural story, absolutely. But if you're Puerto Rican, you're an American citizen. Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States. And, you know, we should be having conversations about statehood. (laughs) Apparently, we're not doing that at the moment. Or other options. I mean, there's also the the, the option of independence, which uh, is very, very alive on Mm -hmm. the island. I think people speak about the three options. There are many more. There are many different ways of, of looking at the future of Puerto Rico and people are discussing it and trying to figure it out. And it's really beyond the scope of the novels that I write, but it's the kind of thing that uh, uh, as a Puerto Rican who cares uh, about this place and the people in it and the people who have had to emigrate from that island, um, there are things that I pay attention to. I mean, I'm obviously not Puerto Rican, but I live in New York and I'm surrounded by folks who have connections to the island, whether they grew up there or family, what have you. And I mean, it sounds like there's so much opportunity for change. And I see it represented in all of your women, right? Mm -hmm. When I see the character arc that you've given Las Madres, there's a lot and it's very cool. And I don't, there's some stuff that happens that we are super not spoiling because I want everyone to be able to enjoy this as you know, as freshly as I did, to be honest, I got the galley. I saw your name. I saw the title and I just started reading. I, was, <laughs> I didn't even look. I honestly, I was like, you know what? It's, I'm sure it's going to be great. But I went back and looked at the flap copy later and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I got all of that. <laughs> so thank you, whoever wrote the flap copy. Um, but I was so excited. And all of these women they have very distinct points of view. They have very distinct experiences. Yes, they're all tied together. Marisol, though, is her mother's primary caretaker, which yes. that's that has to speak to a lot of people across yeah. everywhere right now. Right. Because, I mean, there's this whole sandwich generation, right? You're taking care of your children and you're taking care of your parents. And there's a lot. And Marisol is a nurse and she's got this lovely dude, Warren. <laughs> Thank yeah. you for giving her a nice guy. <laughs> but Marisol to me feels like all of the best bits right of someone who wants to do the right thing and yet she's a little stuck she keeps yeah. putting mom first that's right and this is you know this is something um I have nurses in my life I in fact uh, just getting a little bit from the story during the be- beginning of the pandemic uh, one of my sisters had retired recently from mm-hmm. nursing after 35 years. At least 19 of her cohort of nurses who had retired within the last two or three years volunteered yeah. to work 
in the New York City hospitals during that pandemic. So this is what these people are like, you know, a nurse who, somebody who chooses to do that job is somebody who who wants uh, life, yeah. <laughs> who wants to make sure that if that that life goes as long as possible, as long as the people who are going through it mm-hmm. want it and, and, and are having a good quality of life. And for me, it was it was almost an homage to them because so many of those women from my sister's uh, community mm-hmm. uh, and men, some of them passed away because they Nobody at the beginning, of course, nobody knew. Uh, and Marisol is one of the people who, two years later, she probably would be there. Yeah, uh, I wanted her to be like those people who, where my skills, my connection to humanity, my my love for humanity, I want to be there to help. So, so she was very. I was very clear with her that. I, I wanted her to be that person. I had to learn a lot about nursing because I'm, I'm not. <laughs> and uh, although I, I I did take care of uh, along with my siblings, of course, with mm-hmm. with my my elderly parents until mm-hmm. they passed away. And of course, I'm the eldest of eleven children, so I'm used to taking care of people, probably more resentfully <laughs> than Marisol does. <laughs> I just I just didn't really like being the eldest daughter, but I really understand that you know that thing that you just you can't let go of those people that you're taking care of. You 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 just you love them in a way that in a way even if they're strangers to you for that short period of time that she's working with them, she loves them in a way that other people don't because she doesn't know their history. She doesn't right. know who they are. She's just seeing a suffering human being and I want to help. And that's what I loved about her so much. You know, when she came to me, I was like, oh, you are so nice. I wish you were my friend. (laughs) You gave Graciela something else that I know you're quite fond of, which is this love of tech and social media and staying connected. (laughs) And I was laughing. I mean, it fits her perfectly, but I was laughing when I realized what you were doing because I read earlier interviews where you're like, oh, I think this is great. This is the best thing ever. And I have to say, like, there are people I can stay in touch with on sort of like a low simmer and it's nice. And it's like, oh, your children are lovely. That's great. Or, you know, cousins. Let's talk about that connectivity for a second, because that is so much of what you're writing about in terms of diaspora, right? Like you Mm -hmm. don't always have that connection. You don't always feel part of, or you've got someone saying, well, you're not quite all there, right? Like it's not, you don't have enough grasp of the language or you grew up away or all of these things where people have, lots of opinions, but now we're in a place where sometimes social media isn't the worst thing to roll across right. your desk. Well, as so many of us learned during lockdown that all yeah. of a sudden we can actually see one another through video mm-hmm. in, in a way that many people resisted. And, and I know that because I, I have a very close friend, Joey David, I was also a writer and we, we share our drafts with one another. And so mm-hmm. For years and years and years, we uh, would meet together uh, weekly via Skype, you know, mm-hmm. and this was, and I would tell a lot of my other friends, because when you're a writer, as you know, writers, we live in our own universes alone. We only see a lot of our friends if we don't live in the middle of the city or in Brooklyn, where apparently they all live. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. um, if you're living somewhere else, you don't have the contact. And I would always say to them, oh, come on, you know, what, what, what we Skype and just that we can see. But all of a sudden, everybody had to learn how to do that, how to do that, to do FaceTime, Skype, Zoom, the many other, you know, WebEx, all the other mm-hmm. technologies that all of a sudden became absolutely essential for us. And uh, I, it was a very exciting time for me because I all of a sudden saw people I had not seen in years right? in this, the way that you and I are seeing one another yep. and, and just would be able to talk to each other and have parties and birthday parties and dinner together and those kinds of things. And I loved that people were able to connect with their elders because again, that was the only way to do it. Not just the ones that were, uh, you know, in, in hospitals, but they had to teach them how to work their devices. And that I thought was really, really, really wonderful. 
for, um, I know my parents had already passed when uh, Maria hit Puerto Rico, uh, but I know that that was one of the things that I would very, I would set them up with as soon as I, I could yeah. to be able to stay in touch with them during the time that was possible. But it's wonderful to be able to connect. And one of the things that's very interesting for my community of Latin people from all of Latin America mm -hmm. is that we, the only, if you come from El Salvador or you come from Venezuela or Argentina mm -hmm. or Chile, whatever, mm -hmm. the only way to stay in touch with your loved ones, in fact, were things like this technology. Right. Uh, and so we kind of knew how to, do it long before everyone else realized that, oh, you know, we can do this. I mean, I think for, for a lot of people, it was the thing about privacy. For us, this is the only way we could connect mm -hmm. for people who are so, so far away, you mm -hmm. know. And so I wanted Graciela to be um, kind of that person. She knows, she knows about all this stuff mm -hmm. and, and she loves it. And in a way, that's her way of connecting to the rest of the universe mm -hmm. is to be there and create websites and do research and, and you know, FaceTime and all that stuff that, that she enjoys and, mm -hmm. and does as well. Although she's a little more extreme than I am. <laughs> yeah, it's a little harder to keep secrets in this day and age. And that's all I'm yeah. going to say there. But I appreciate her quite a lot. But is that why you write? Do you write to connect? Do you write to be heard or do you write to connect or are they not separate? I, I write to be seen. I remember when I came to the United States, uh, within two days of being here, a girl about my age who I talked to, you know, in, in this big, tall building, I had lived in rural Puerto Rico. Here I am in Brooklyn, right? And this girl, the first thing she asked me is, Era hispana. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> what is that hispana? I had no idea. Uh, she said, well, you know, if you come from a Spanish-speaking country, that's, that's who you are. And I'm going like, but wait a second, I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> you know, what happened? And she says, well, you know, here they call us Hispanics. And it was shocking to me. And then I realized, oh, uh, even, you know, my very particular culture, language, uh, music, my accent, and in Spanish, which is very different from, let's say, a Mexican accent or Argentinian, all these things are uh, unknowable in the United States. And so in that, in that way, I felt invisible. Once I learned um, how to read in English, and of course, I learned English by reading, um, I realized there was nobody like me. And the, my, the big moment in my life when I realized that I was invisible and I could be made invisible was when Langston Hughes came to my high school to do an event. This handsome, graceful man dressed in like an ivory suit with a beautiful tie and, and this gorgeous face and and kind and sweet and and he talked about his work and he read from his books and I got on the train that right after school and I didn't even go home I went to the library and I asked the wonderful helpful librarian I want everything by Mr. Langston Hughes <laughs> and I'm sure, you know I'd written it up and I took it home and I read everything mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that she had uh, given me from from the stacks and she said I can get you more I go everything I want to read everything <laughs> and, and so all of a sudden I understood that this man he's not Puerto Rican eventually I learned that he translated a um yeah. into into English so he was a poet and that it just everything about him was so exciting and he became my mentor without even knowing it he was the person who first told me oh if I feel invisible, I mm -hmm. have to make other people see me <laughs> because I'm here. Right. And so I th think that that's where this begins, this sense that I have to make myself, my people, my history, my family, the people that I love, I have to make them visible to people who ordinarily um, would just pass you on the street and not even glance in that direction. With Conquistadora, too. I mean, there are people who 
we're trying to say, well, this woman never would have existed. And you're like, well, actually, I don't have any family records. So I think this woman did. And you can't tell me <laughs> otherwise. And we know who writes history. And yeah. so I'm just going to, and I'm just thinking about, you know, talk about being, you're, you're giving everyone their due. And one of the things you do in Las Madres too, is you give everyone first and last names to yeah. make sure that everyone is acknowledged and named. And I just, yeah. those, all of those acts, right? All of those things add up where you're like, no, you can't tell me that these people didn't exist just because you don't think you've ever experienced someone like this. And I love the idea that they all fold up under you. (laughs) And there's this idea that I'm going to be seen and I'm going to bring some people along with me, right? Like that's what books are about. You hold the door open for someone else. That's right. I mean, I I really, I want to be the Langston Hughes for somebody (laughs) I mean, I really wish and, and I hope that, you know, there's going to be some time young man or woman mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. who says, oh, you know, this person got me on this path of writing and to make myself visible in a society that does everything possible to make me invisible. So, yes, and I think with Conquistadora, one of the interesting things is, you know, that story is completely, completely fiction. I, yeah. I, <laughs> my family are were not wealthy. They did not own land. In fact, my entire family was landless peasants. But I really wanted to explore what it's like to be a Spaniard, mm-hmm. a young woman faced with this place uh, in the beginning of the 19th century and then having her own dreams and aspirations. The interesting thing is that I can't tell you how many people have written to me saying, you know, this story is like my great aunt or my great grandmother. Uh, Did you find her journals? Uh, Could you send me a copy of the journals? (laughs) (laughs) No, Jesus. It was just, I made her up based on, uh, you know, a lot of research that Mm -hmm, I did. mm -hmm. And, And also because frankly, I had a 19th century upbringing until I came to New York. I was living like these people lived at that time. And so I I knew a lot about it. Plus, I uh, talked to my parents who lived that life from the perspective of the people literally on the ground, not the the wealthy, mostly white, mostly male, Mm -hmm. mostly well-educated men who wrote about us from a very, very, you know, quite a distance. And I just wanted to bring them to make them real with all all its dirt and smells <laughs> and touch uh, and what it's like for an aristocratic woman to face mm-hmm. this. And I think with Las Madres, I, I also try to, to bring the, the, the tactile oh, aspect yes. <laughs> of being, of being alive, you know, yes. it's, it's a, I really love the sensory uh, aspects of mm-hmm. living, uh, and maybe I think even more so after my stroke, where mm-hmm. for a certain period of time, I didn't have access to a lot of these things. And, uh, and so the, this whole aspect of textures and smells and sounds and music and, and, and the sound of voices and which language do you speak? When do you speak in Spanish? When do you speak in English? Mm-hmm. My, there are characters that speak languages I don't speak in <laughs> Las Madres. <laughs> I'm like, why are you speaking German? <laughs> I don't speak that language. You know, um, but, but again, I, I've known people like this in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they are Puerto Rican. And they are not what people think. They are much more fuller much fuller than what people are familiar with. And I think we need to be able to define our own communities, right? Like a lot of the literature of East Asia certainly has been translated by white men. Yes. <laughs> I'm just like, well, yes. why? <laughs> you know, you're bringing Hello. a very specific POV to this. And yes, you yeah. may be a renowned scholar and a renowned translator. And I do not doubt that your Japanese is better than mine. But there's some cultural stuff. <laughs> yes, yes. There is some cultural and, stuff that maybe you might be missing. <laughs> yes, and there's also the gaze. I mean, a woman looks yeah. at, at women in a different way that men do. I think that this is one reason I it's just so, so important for for us to to read. If I'm reading a translation, that's mm-hmm. the first thing I look for. 
if this character, the main character, male or female, mm-hmm. and who is the translator, nothing to take away no. from the translators who are very well trained and I admire mm-hmm. even the, the fact that they even do it. It's, it's fantastic. But I really want to, I, I do want that connection yeah. that um, that we have with one another. I mean, I have a connection with Puerto Ricans I don't have with people from other places. Mm-hmm. Even if I don't know if they're Puerto Rican, right. it's so weird and it's so strange. And, you know, like Ada says, we recognize each other mm-hmm. without even knowing, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's something that maybe it comes through the DNA or whatever, whatever it comes from. I don't question it. I just know it exists. And I've had so many, many experiences in which um, I have met total strangers <laughs> who turn out to you know, to have had a connection to to uh, have had ancestors or they were Puerto Rican or their mm-hmm. grandmother or their mother, whatever. Um, so I think, again, you know, my work really is, like you asked, it is about connecting, mm-hmm. connecting my, my experience, my history, my culture, my Puerto Rican Spanish, all these things with the greater scheme of humanity, you know, and and this is, I think, this is really why I write. I want to connect this little tiny little island. When if you look at a map of this hemisphere, <laughs> it's a dot. <laughs> Puerto Rico. It's not even a shape. It's just like this little block there, you know. And yet, three million people live there, you know, and they have lives and they have histories. They have emotions. And it always humbles me mm-hmm. to look at a whole globe yeah. and then see my little speck and realize I came from that little speck. And I'm going to make sure that it is not invisible, that it's bigger than a speck in people's minds who maybe that's all they see. I love that idea. I really do. Do you have a favorite moment from Las Madres? whether it was you in the writing or something that a character did that we can talk about that isn't a spoiler? There's a moment um, that, there were two moments that were very particularly, uh, one of them made me smile through it. And that is uh, when Marisol is walking around the Bronx with all the Puerto Rican flags, you know, uh, and it had had been recently Puerto Rican uh, parade time. And so her vision, you know, all of a sudden it's like, I live here, but all of a sudden today I see flags everywhere, you know? And so this is one thing. um, Actually, I was raised more in Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. but my, uh, my sisters ended up living in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I remember that from going to the, Puerto Rican communities in the Bronx, people were displaying their flag with such pride and, and you know, nobility, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just, and then it just become something entirely different, you know. So um, that was really fun to write. And, mm-hmm. and when that scene came to mind, I was mm-hmm. just, I had a good time with that. Uh, and then I remember, um, I knew because these women go to Puerto Rico right, and right. Maria is happening. Uh, and so I knew, and I was dreading, <laughs> how am I going to deal with this right. hurricane situation? And I remember one day, literally, I just woke up and I said, okay, I am going to become a hurricane today in my writing. I have to do this. And I sat down very early, okay. uh, seven in the morning, no breakfast, no mm-hmm. nothing. I just said to myself, you have to do this. You have to get through this because I knew it was going to be difficult. And it took me the whole day mm-hmm. to to be this hurricane. <laughs> it's still emotional for me when I read it because the things that happened during that event, uh, we did not know until after it was over. Right. And uh, including, you know, some of my um, some of the things that are discussed in that particular chapter, uh, things that happened to people in my family. It still moves me, um, yeah. even though I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. almost as if somebody else did it. <laughs> you know, listening to you talk about the experience of writing this book and and the things that you love about writing and the, the sort of tactile bits of it. You also wrote the screen adaptation for Almost a Woman, which was your second memoir, which 
I still can't get over this, but it aired on PBS's Masterpiece Theater. And yeah. I love that. It just feels so subversive and right and good. And But I mean, I think Masterpiece Theater and I think upstairs, downstairs and not, I know. you know. I know. Well, I always call it, I call it uh, men on horses, women in corsets. That's, that yeah. was going to be Masterpiece Theater. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I just, I every chance I get to say that, you know, Almost a Woman was aired on Masterpiece Theater it just delights me to no end. But screenwriting is a different set of writing muscles entirely. And you actually have to strip out all of the things. I mean, obviously it's character and dialogue and that moves the story forward, but you have to strip out all of the bits you actually really like to write. I know. I know. I'm it's having like, a moment of wait, wait what? <laughs> like you have to not do the things you really like most. And and I'm sitting here kind of going, wait, how do you what? So can we talk about that shift for a second? Because I think there are lots of folks who think when they see a thing on the screen, right, it's such a different process. Can we just talk about that for a second? Oh, sure. No, no. Um, well, my husband and I have, ho- have owned a film company for since 1976. Uh, we do um, art and documentary films. And so so my first really uh, consistent writing was of um, documentaries and educational films. So I knew the technique more or less, but uh, I had never written a full, you know, one and a half hours worth of screen of screenwriting. And it was really difficult because like you say, you cannot, uh, the directors don't like it for you to mm-hmm. say anything about it. They don't want you to describe anything. Everything has right. to happen by action and dialogue, you know. So and so, you know, kill somebody. <laughs> they don't want to know. You know, they they just want to know, is it a gun or a knife? You know, they do not want the details. It was very, very difficult for me to do that because, of course, I had the book, which I wrote with all the stuff that I love because my first language is Spanish and Spanish is very expansive. And we love description. We have lots of syllables and that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my God. You know, (laughs) you can't even say he said. You just put the character's name on top and then, you know, so it was a very challenging um, period of time, which I had to do very, very quickly, actually, because like now there's a Writers Guild strike still happening at the time that you and I are talking. At that time, another strike was imminent. And so we had to do it very quickly. And I remember how I basically had to kind of turn off the this person (laughs) And then become somebody else who only um, spoke and and then just gave very, very, very little information, just enough for them change of scene. It's raining Mm -hmm. (laughs) or it's daytime or, you know, (laughs) sunrise or whatever, where where I would have written this. The sun comes over slowly over the mountain, spreading over the beautiful view. No. The sun rises, you know, <laughs> it was annoying. There were times, you know, I have to say, I was like, really, why can't I do that? You know, that's what I see. But mm-hmm. that wasn't my job. You know, right. once you, as a writer, you're, you're creating something for somebody else. And this is one reason why I became a book writer and stopped being a screenwriter, because I, I want to control the entire universe and I don't <laughs> want to be a film director. So... <laughs> It's a compl- it is a completely different thing. But I think I must say for screenwriting, you really pay a lot of attention, of course, to dialogue mm-hmm. yeah. and, and plot. You know, if you're a good screenwriter and you're really, you, you know how to put together a story in a way that people who don't have that kind of training sometimes struggle with. And so um, in my writing, I outline my work and I always start with what happens at the end. Okay. In my mind. Uh, uh, in my mind, what, where, you know, I have these characters that have been buzzing around in my mm-hmm. head. And then I said, well, who are they and where they're going and <laughs> what are they doing? Mm-hmm. And, you know, how, it, how is this story going to end? And then I also think, well, what happens in the middle? And again, this is screen structure that I know yeah. that is just ingrained in me. And so the middle in, in, in screen writing, it's like a climax, a big moment. As I said, what is that middle moment that then brings the characters to that the end? Because it's very easy to start. 
finishing a book is really, really hard. That training has helped me in in the writing of of, of novels and I really love the expansiveness of, of writing fiction. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not a meta writer. <laughs> I love description. I love movement. I love beautiful words. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I have access to two languages. How cool is that? <laughs> it's fabulous. It's fabulous. <laughs> You know, when you were doing some of the promotion for Conquistadora in hardcover, you mentioned that it might be the start of a trilogy. And not in the conventional sense is Las Madres a sequel to Conquistadora at all, but I could see them sitting as part of a trilogy. And I'm just wondering, am I reading that correctly? Or are you thinking about you Conquistadora a in a different... You are smart reader. Okay. Okay. So they <laughs> well, are part of a trilogy. A very intelligent okay. reader. Yes, uh, no, deliberate. They, this is actually um, Las Madres is what probably would have been uh, one of the last in the book. I, I uh, originally I, I I considered this as a series of four books, and then I said, well, maybe I can do it in three. Okay. <laughs> and then I think, no, I think maybe it's going to be five. The history of Puerto Rico is so fascinating yeah. to me, and I have a lot of information about the history of Puerto Rico, because my family, they were still alive and I recorded them. So I have a lot of information. And then my dad, who was also loved technology, I Mm -hmm. sent him these little cassette players, recorders, and he would love when he would go visit his friends Mm -hmm. or the family, he would bring his tape recorder and he would just put it in the middle of the room. And I have access to them telling stories. So I have so much information. I have many books. I have to live long enough to write all these stories. But so Conquistadora was the beginning. Okay. And um, there's another book that is actually written that it's sitting in a drawer right now. It's done, which would have been the real actual. It, it begins the day that uh, Conquistadora ends. Then there's another book. And then I, because of Maria, it just accelerated the story for me. I needed to 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 get these characters in there. So yes, these women are all descendants, distant <laughs> descendants, mm-hmm. and they don't know That's uh, okay. of the people we that know. you meet in Conquistadora. And you know, and the places, of course, are are uh, places that have evolved since mm-hmm. Conquistadora. And I'm so, I'm so grateful that you figured it out and that you noticed it, because I really worked very hard to make sure that, that it was there. It was a very cool reading experience. I will say you can read either on their own. It's just, it was really delightful for me when I started. I, and it was very early sort of in Las Madres where I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I see what's happening here. And obviously, yeah. you know, again, you can read them separately if you'd like. It's a richer experience if you have both of them, but you certainly do not need to have read Conquistadora mm-hmm. in order to to sit and enjoy Las Madres, which yeah. is certainly... I had read it, but at the same time, you know, it had been a while, my friend, between books. Yeah. So. <laughs> yes, it has it took been me a, a minute to catch up with you. <laughs> it was it was a while. I mean, there were a lot of things going on in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I did write the other book that is yep. uh, that is you know the, the real technical sequel to Conquistadora, and then of course I I like Marisol. I was a, a caretaker for yeah. for my parents. Uh, I, uh, I do have a lot of sisters and brothers, so. I didn't do it by myself, right, but it but did require a lot of attention at a very vulnerable and tender time for both of them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they were living in completely, you know, my mother was living here. My father was living in Puerto Rico. And so there was a lot of back and forth and, and, um, and emotion because, of course, mm-hmm. when you're taking uh, care of somebody, as Marisol introduces us to, if we were not aware, is that all the things that you're feeling you can't express to the person that you're taking care of because they're going through enough and your job is to make things easier and and better for them. And, um, and so I I was going through a lot of that stuff Mm -hmm. with parents, you know, flying here, flying there. (laughs) It was, it was a lot. And, um, but all the time, you know, thinking and writing and knowing that all these characters are alive in my head, (laughs) <laughs> uh, the other book was finished. It's put away. Uh, Las Madres is here. There's probably a book or two in between those okay. books. And that's uh, probably what I'm going to be working on next. And that is what I'm, I'm like, maybe about halfway through okay. uh, the next uh, 
the next book. I think it's important. I want, I want at the end, whenever I'm gone, that people mm-hmm. can read this whole history of Puerto Rico and these people that some of them were known to me mm-hmm. uh, and I and others that I invented. And for me, they are, a lot of them are, well, Ana and Severo and Conquistadora are my imaginary ancestors. Right. So my imaginary ancestors are speaking to me mm-hmm. and telling me, do not forget us. Mm-hmm. There's a lot going on about Puerto Ricans today. Don't forget us. We survived so that you could tell this story. And I take that very, very seriously. And that came to me from that one moment in high school with Langston Hughes saying, this is what I'm doing. He's still speaking to me. He's still mentoring me through this. And I adore him. I have a picture of him in my wall, in my my office, and, and just... Thank, thank you. I love that. I love that story so, so much. And I cannot wait to read the next book and the book after that and the book after that and however many thank more you. I get. <laughs> Esmeralda Santiago, thank you so much. Las Madres is out now. I am When I Was Puerto Rican is certainly in paperback and Conquistador. There are a lot of books to choose from, from Esmeralda. Thank but you. Las Madres is pretty spectacular. Thank you. And I would like to just mention that all my books are available in Spanish. Um, Yay. And I, I do hope that people who uh, would prefer to read it in Spanish, they have uh, access to that. And uh, hopefully they will get back in touch with me after they've read them and tell me. I really love to hear from my readers. This is my, uh, you know, years and years of working on these books. And mm-hmm. then one day you get an email or a text or something from someone who has reached out because you moved them. That's that's fantastic. Okay, and readers can find you through your website and on Facebook and on Instagram, yes? And on Instagram and on Twitter. Oh, okay, I'm you're on Twitter. Place. <laughs> okay, excellent. Esmeralda, thank you so much. It was so much fun to talk to you. Thank you. It was great talking to you and thank you for liking my books. I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Port Over. And Elizabeth Acevedo is a National Poetry Slam champion, which I haven't been able to say that in a really long time. And it makes me happy. So I'm leading with that. She also has a National Book Award, of course, for Poet X and a Carnegie Medal and a Walter Award and a Horn Book Honor Award. Lots of good things have happened for Elizabeth over the course of her career. And we have so much ground to cover, but she's also written her first novel for adults. And it's called Family Lore. And I promise you, you are going to love these women the way I love these women. (laughs) There are some men in here that, you know, well, some of them we love and some of them we don't, but really it is about a family of women. And Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you to introduce listeners to these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful women. Thank you so much for that introduction, for the excitement. I'm excited to be here with you, Mila. Family Lore follows two generations of women, um, four elders, right, in their late 60s, early 70s. We have Flor, who can see when someone is going to die in her dreams. We have Matilde, who uh, doesn't have an innate magic, but can dance like nobody's business. We have Pastora, who is known to not have silk on her tongue. She will tell you like it is, and she can tell when you are not telling it like it is. And we have the forgotten sister Camila, who is the youngest and an herbalist. And then Pastora and Flor both have daughters. And that is the next generation that's kind of bringing a little bit of the urban hip hop young millennial flair to the novel. And so we have Ona, who is someone that possesses an alpha vagina. And I'm not going to spoil anything, but you can make with that (laughs) what you will. And we have Yadi, her cousin, who at the ripe age of 20 inherited a taste for limes. And so some of these magics and powers are really quirky, but Um, These are women whose capacities in various realms (laughs) are kind of on on a wide range of of supernatural and magical and fantastic. It's fun, this book. It's very real, too. There are a lot of real world moments that are part of this narrative as well. But when did you start working on this? I sort of feel like for my research, it was like you were writing multiple things at once and kind of putting things down and coming back and sort of th- figuring out where you felt your work was going in terms of the poetry and where it was going in terms of the prose. So when did you actually start working on family lore? 
I think the hard thing is that for me, writing is thinking. So I'll think about a book for a long time before I ever really get started. But I remember in 2009, visiting my aunts in the Bronx and kind of being like, she deserves to be in somebody's book, right? And at the time, my mother is one of 15 children, one of nine sisters. It's massive. I have like 64 first cousins. Like it is legion, right? And so I wanted to write a collection of short stories, each kind of loosely based on, you know, each one of these aunts. That's in 09. I write many other things. At the time, I did not know how to write fiction. I didn't know how to write prose. There was a lot of things I needed to teach myself before I could kind of conquer that approach uh, or this this wider story. And then 10 years later in 2019 was the first time when I started writing. And I began with the character that ended up being no, Ona, talking about wanting to go to Columbia University and like what it felt like to not be able to go to school in the neighborhood where you're raised. And from there, that one character and her alpha vagina led to the, <laughs> the, the, the populated the novel. And I lost some sisters and I combined some things and then the imagination took over and a whole new story emerged. It's a great story and it happens really over the course of like two days. Yeah. It's really a compressed timeline. I mean, we have a moment where you're sort of setting everything up and you're like six weeks out and we get this very sort of quickie. And I'm a little prolonged. Prolonged. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then all of a sudden we are in it and you're flipping back. And I, I love the setup of this too, the physical setup of the story, because you're flipping back and forth in time. We're getting mom stories, auntie stories. We're getting stories set in the DR with grandmas and some aunties that you and I are going to elliptically discuss because I have questions about those aunties. Okay. <laughs> you know the aunties I'm talking about. Yeah. And you're also cutting back and forth between the first person and the third person. See, you made a lot of really sort of complicated choices. Yeah. And I don't know if you did it as you were sitting down to write, or if that all came with the revision. I mean, you've talked about this in the past, how you've done really hard revisions on previous work. And I'm kind of like, all right, let's 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 talk about this structure before we come back to the characters. Yeah. There were some hard choices that I had to figure out as the novel developed. I learned very quickly. One of the first characters I had to write was Matilde and Matilde's yeah. wedding game. And I realized in that moment that the way memory would work was going to affect form, right? That there was this going to be this back and forth, this back and forth, right? This ebb, which is fascinating because she's a dancer. So it makes sense that she was the one who taught me how we're going to step forward and we're also going to, right? And so I knew this rhythm wasn't always going to be as forward moving as some of my other novels, that a lot of it was going to be spent in nostalgia and that was going to have its own effect, Right. And so I'm glad you brought up that the pacing does this thing because that's super intentional. I thought it was all going to be written in third person. Okay. But the things that I was interested in is how do those of us who come from oral storytelling backgrounds where we learn, we don't have like a a, a chart with our descendants, right? We don't have a coat of arms. We don't have it written neatly in someone's front page of the Bible, right? We learn about family members from talking to each other, from stories, from learning, oh, this nickname is for actual, for this great grandfather and we're piecing it together. How do you make text out of what you learn orally? And, right. and one of the projects of the book is trying to capture the stories from the person who is telling you how they love, who they love, how they learn to be a woman, right? And that the answers complicate each other, contradict each other, <laughs> contradict timelines, right? <laughs> You're kind of, you have to figure out with ensemble truth telling, which I think is what like oral history can be, where do I find the through line in all of this. And so the first person kind of had to come through to just try to hold the project, mm-hmm. the larger project mm-hmm. of why we're hearing it in this way. Yeah. I was about to say, it's a little bit of a book within a book, a little bit, yeah. not not quite, but there is a little bit of that element. So yeah. if that's, if that is, you know, one of the forms of literature you love, the book. Yeah. The story. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's you can family see lore. Toggled. Yeah. It's, we have the, it, it's very fun. Of the wake, and then what's happening with these perspectives? Why? Uh huh. Part of why I wanted to talk about structure too is, you know, I, as a reader, I think there's a difference between telling an immigrant story and telling a diaspora story. 
And yeah. family lore feels much more like a diaspora story to me. And I and it's not necessarily just because of the Dominican experience in the United States, right? Like we're in New York, we have, or I'm in New York, and we have one of the largest Dominican populations outside of the DR itself. But if you think about diaspora communities, right? Like I'm also thinking of Puerto Rico, right? Like Las Madres, the Esmeralda Santiago that's about to come out, Olga Dies Dreaming, the Sochi Gonzalez. Like these are more stories of diaspora than they are about necessarily coming to America. And I think it's easy for some people to conflate the two or just assume that a diaspora story is an immigrant story. And I would love to put your women into that context because I really, they are of both places and yet yeah, they're of their own place. And, you know, being part of a diaspora, right? Like you're in this weird liminal space. Yeah. And I, I'm, I think the liminal space is something that I'm continuously exploring, right? Yeah, the, totally. The dash between Dominican, Dominican American, Dominican native, but of American citizenship, right? Like this, right. what what happens in this in between when you are no longer of one group and are not fully in another? Yeah, I love this distinction you're making because. I have heard the book described as like this immigrant saga and that that didn't feel precise. Um, although four of the women, right, do emigrate to the U.S. But I think stories of immigration are often on the process of immigration or right. on the journey. It's about the journey. I think diaspora is, is often about the longing for what you don't know and for what you had to leave behind and how you had to leave it behind. But But maybe you're already a bit more you've already repotted. You're already in the pot that you yeah, are yeah. to be in for a while. It's not the it's not the process of removing you from the from the ground, right? And I think that the perspective of the younger generation, which has lived in the US for as long as it has for the for these women's pretty yeah. much entire lives, I think they ground the novel in a very different way that feels um American and their relationship to the Dominican Republic is different from each other, Yadi and Ona. Okay. Um but their but their narratives are based here. Yeah, and I love the fact too that Ona she teaches. She's uh, she's a professor, and she's doing some research. Yeah, yeah. But you give her this line, sort of, in the middle of the book, where she's talking to her classes, and she's like, "Listen, I'm not doing a download for you. I'm not handing you a USB and saying this is where we're from and who we are and everything else." I said, she's like, "I'm trying to construct a picture of who we are." Yeah. With your help, like all of us need to participate. I mean, obviously, I'm paraphrasing you slightly poorly. Sorry about that. But it's a beautiful moment in the book, especially because of who she is as a character, too. But she's like, listen, there is no blueprint. There is no cookie cutter. There is no stamp. It's just we've got. And again, this comes back to what you were saying about the oral tradition and building a text out of an oral tradition. Like mm -hmm. Academia, certainly, you know, for sure. That's part yeah. of it. That's yeah. a really big part of it. Like, who gets to tell the story? Yeah. And how do you honor the way that stories get yeah. told? If the artifacts don't look how we imagine. What What do we do with that that material? But that I think when we talk about diaspora, that's a living thing. It yeah. is constantly growing and changing on us. Mm -hmm. I mean, particularly, I think you see it with with language, right? Mm -hmm. We went from from Hispanic to Latinos to Latinx to Latin. And, I, you know, some people get really frustrated. Why can't right. we find the term? And I think for me, it's what language, you know, unless it's a dead language, it is a right. living language. And it right, is right. Living. And it's about precision. It's about that generation saying mm -hmm. this names us. And then the next generation says, no, it doesn't. And we find something else and we say this names us. And so I, I think for me that moment within family lore where she's saying we're we're building this thing yeah, yeah, yeah. understanding of who we are it is a collective experience right yeah. i mean and for me language needs to evolve right and i think we're living in a moment too in our social history where language has evolved at a pace that has made some people cross their eyes and <laughs> other people have said well finally you're catching up a little bit which is great but i mean language is such a powerful, gorgeous thing. I mean, when I think about the fact that you wanted to start out in music before yes. you came to poetry, right? And you think in things in terms of a 4-4 four, four beat, which is, you know, I know enough about music to know that that's like a basic building block. And I love the mm -hmm. idea that you've added 
words sort of on top of that, but you keep the cadence. And that, again, goes back to that oral storytelling tradition, but it's also a musicality that not everyone can capture. I mean, obviously you must read your stuff out loud as you're working. There's yes. no way you can't. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's just no way you can't. <laughs> oh, I do. I, I've okay. never thought of the way that hip hop and hip hop is very much a 444. Yeah. Talk about a bar. That's, yep. It's, it's yep. the metronome, right? And, and that's what makes it fun to find different pockets. I get asked a lot about how my poetic background influences my prose. And so I'm going to steal that next time. Uh, please do, because I feel it. I mean, yeah. just having read across your work. You're talking about comedy, though. Like, yeah. it's it's how do we grab rhythm and music? Mm-hmm. I think more novelists would would do well to mm-hmm. read more poetry and, and to read song lyrics and think yeah. about rhythm because I it it does so much on the emotional level yeah, yeah, that totally. you can realize when you have momentum and you take out punctuation and and the rhythm is just straightforward that creates anxiety it creates mm-hmm. chaos it dictates that's what's happening with the character when you find the beat and you low you slow it down that creates a way to like sink into language and so mm-hmm. you can participate as the writer right. how the reader is receiving this by just having like a really strong grasp of music mm-hmm. But how much do you have to flip, though, when like, is there a set of poetry muscles and then a set of prose muscles? Like, are you flipping back and forth between two sets of muscles or are you just saying this is the word that works now? This is the structure that works now. I mean, I can't think of many novels for adults that have been written as long form. I mean, Vikram Seth had a novel called Golden Gate a million years ago and comes to mind. There aren't maybe a couple of Russians. There's not a lot, but YA has embraced the form, which I think is fantastic because anything that gets you in the door and keeps you here. But I mean, Natalie Diaz is an influence for you. Ilya Kaminsky is an influence for you. Lucille Clifton. Like you're pulling from lots of different places. Yeah, I do. I think I'm I'm lucky to be in the lineage of a lot of incredible yeah. poets that I study. I've always been drawn to narrative, though. So even as a poet, a lot of my poems have like a place and a character and a thing that was said like an inciting incident and then a response. So most of my poems are response poems. And I think it's because I've always thought about scenario. Right. So my my instinct is the narrative. But music and poetry was my way to language. And so there's this thing that's happening. I would say family lore probably gets the closest to this um, marriage of prose and poetry and how my head, right, that I had, I had to balance six different storylines. And so their narrative inclination, but the language was, was at the forefront. The interiority of their lives was at the forefront. This was not about heavily plotted beats. It wasn't about, oh, and then all the conflicts are going to boom, boom, bap. Like that, mm-hmm. that's not how I'm not as interested in in those really clean, well plotted. I I want to know what are the kinds of choices that women would make, and and I want to be mindful of feeling that yes thought, yes action, and yes how we hold things in our body and that coming across. Yeah, I really love the push and pull sort of between the two generations where the mothers are, the mothers and the aunties are like, well, we don't really want to tell you those stories. And yeah. <laughs> Ona and Yadi are looking at them going, you didn't tell us that. And it's that, con- and we all have it, like, regardless of our background, you know, mothers are complicated, aunties are complicated, daughters are, con- like, we're all complicated. For sure. But you also want to control your own narrative. <laughs> yeah. Everyone wants to control their own narrative, right? Yeah. And so listening to them and listening to the silence of the older generation. Like, I think we leave that out of the conversation a lot of the time when we're, when we're pushing, you know, our elders to yeah. tell us what it was like. And then, I mean, half the time I'm listening for the silences. I'm listening for the stuff that they're leaving out. Cause I'm like, you are not telling me the whole story. What can't they, say? What can't they look at anymore? Yeah. Or what, what do they think if they say will cause you to yeah. imagine differently? I mean, silence appears on the page in varying ways. There will be literal speech that said yep. and then the sign is she didn't say that yeah. like of course she didn't say that right like this is what I imagine she is thinking there are moments where people are redacted and it's like why mm-hmm. not how can't the name be said right that I think when folks particularly come from inherited trauma yeah. and and silence is a weapon right mm-hmm. to feel what for you 
there's something to be said about how you communicate that on the page and how how reluctant folk can be to tell their story. And so I had to find really, without saying she couldn't say this because it would hurt, like, how do I show the gaps in the stories? I mean, that's one of the things I love about the older generation, Flora and her sisters, especially Pastora, right? Because she's yeah. got this ability. And it it saves her in a moment in her youth and then makes things much more complicated. And to see her sister, to see Floor show up for her the way Floor does, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. But all of the things they couldn't say were the things that got them into trouble because they did say them instead of keeping quiet. All of these things that happened and then to have it switch to be in a place where they're like, well, actually, I can say whatever I want and I will say whatever I want, but not about the thing you're actually asking. About. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> they no. will not. It will not. No, no. And I think that feels so honest. Like, I don't know how many. Oh, it's very honest. Your family, but I will ask one thing and my mom will answer something else. And I'm like, wait, but that, but that's the story she wanted to tell. Yeah. That's the story she needs to tell. You know, and so when you're talking about, well, silence, it's like, well, maybe you haven't had an opportunity and the question doesn't matter. You were going to tell this story because it's a story you need to get right out of your body, regardless of what I asked. <laughs> You know, one of the things I appreciate, too, about family lore is that it's a coming of age for many different women at different points in their lives, that it's not just like, you know, a lot of the times when we're talking about coming of age stories, right, especially now we're thinking, oh, teenagers, 20 somethings, like the narrative of the messy 20 something girl. I'm just like, yeah, oh, here we go again. OK, but, you know, we have a couple of characters who, as you say, are in their 60s and 70s. <laughs> yeah. They finally learn some things like. I can remove myself from this situation, which yeah. is not something women are commonly taught anywhere. Oh, right. Like you can remove yourself from a situation like you can physically For sure. just, you know, and watching the evolution yeah. of the moms and the aunties is so much fun. It's not, I, I mean, I'm glad Yadi and Omar are there. <laughs> Please don't misunderstand me. I mean, they're great, but not every older person gets to change. Yeah. And push forward the way you let these women or the way these women just decided to do it. And you wrote about it. I'm not sure which happened for you, but. No, I, I mean, I, I knew from the beginning that I'm, I admire the way the women in my family are vibrant and they're not just off in the corner because they've grown a certain age. It's not like now it's time for the next generation to take the front stage. Like they're mm. very involved. They are dancing. They are part of of the the way the family holds itself together. Mm -hmm. And yet there's so much I didn't know. And so curiosity about where are you now and the whys of how you land here mm -hmm. and stay here or or choose not to was a big part of, of wanting to imagine that magic can be discovered at any age, right? right. And, and every metaphor of what magic can mean there. At 72, you can make some big choices about your life and yeah. And be okay with the ramifications. I was really intrigued by some of the the conflict that they they encounter, and also the way that their youth, right, going back in the past and and kind of looking at what would allow you to get here, and also make it really hard to leave here. I mean, it's wild if you were, we're talking about nostalgia for a life in a place that wasn't always easy for these women, and yet it's still home. It's family. It's a really fine line to walk, and mm -hmm. it's a complicated. Yeah. Line to walk. Again, you balance past and present, and there's some suggestion in the future, but mostly you, you're you doing this thing where you're flipping around, and it's not necessarily linear, which I really like. It's like, well, this is the part of the story we just need to tell, and this is the part we're going to tell now. How much did you surprise yourself as you were writing family lore? I mean, again, like you're doing some stuff on the page here that is not the easiest thing for a writer no. yeah. to choose. I surprised myself quite a bit. I mean, I I am very clear that I will not be writing the poetics again, right? And I don't want to. There are readers who just want the same book over and over and every single book I want to try something different. I want to move I'm stretching. This book stretched me. And I mean like it's going to be nine stories and then it's going to be stories that are linked in in our novel and then it's going to be this living wake and because we're thinking about death we're going to have to reconsider things. And then Matilde talked about her wedding and I realized this is what's happening. We are in the present and the present is going to take us to what we need to know about how we got here. 
And it was even more nonlinear. And I had to make concessions to the fact that, like, oh, okay. I guess we just have to follow it <laughs> to be able to hold on to, to something. But for me, it, you know, that is not how I know stories to be told. I mean, I'll be in the middle of a story with especially someone who's older. And it's like, as they're telling it, they're like, oh, wait, but for you to know that, you have to first know this. So let me let me backtrack. And then they go off and they never get back to the first story. They're just you know, <laughs> meandering in memory. And I think there's something about wanting to capture cadence, wanting to capture what the character thinks it's most important for, mm-hmm. for someone to know. That the past may not be, you may not know the exact age that the person was there, you know, but the present is always really clear, is really straightforward, is the timeline of the present is is narrated by hours. You know exactly where you are. Mm-hmm, the past mm-hmm. is murkier, right? The past might require a little bit more work to make sense of. And that's okay, right? I think sometimes. Western storytelling, particularly American storytelling, wants to hold on to time in a way that is really tight. And we think that's the only way a novel can pace itself. But that doesn't feel Caribbean. Like That's, that's not how we experience time. That's not how you, you go to DR. Time is different. And so, like, I wanted to write from a tradition that that challenged mm-hmm. the way we think of time and storytelling and and how a narrative can be held. And that's going to be hard for some folks, right? There's like you mentioned, there's a lot of risks on the page, but I think some people are going to find it so rewarding to have a different kind of thing at play. I think it's totally satisfying because the women's voices are so clear to me and the way you cut between them and the relationships they have with each other. Also, (laughs) Pastora has a job in a clothing (laughs) store and she meets someone and she is, um, she has feelings about it. Yeah, she has a lot very, of feelings about it. Very strong feelings. <laughs> she has. And uh, I'm just kind of laughing because she's not really someone that you would want to have mad at you. And I'm talking <laughs> about a fictional character. I'm talking about someone that you made up and I read about. And I'm laughing because I can absolutely imagine her out yeah. in the world being her very best for herself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. Some of these characters feel, they felt so real. I mean, I could have written anecdote after anecdote. I had, there was so, there were so many sections. Mm-hmm. Each one of them had, there there were, it, you know, it was so fun to play in their memories, to, to mm-hmm. think about if you could tell five stories who would let me understand who you are, what would they be, right? And, and those kept evolving and having to cut them and probably could have cut further if I wanted to make this a really, you know, a, a particular kind of narrative, but, mm-hmm. but I gave it breath. I gave it time, but they were real to me. This novel was written from 2020, right? May of 2020. Yeah. When I began with a writer's group, I had been sporadically writing since 2019, but I really sat on daily until pretty much 2022, right? When I turned right. it in, right? As I was about to give birth. And oh, so tiny person and book at the same time. Tiny person. Tiny person turns oh, nine months. He has officially been out of my body as long as he was in my body. <laughs> Four days before the book comes out. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, yay, everyone. I'm delighted that tiny person is here, but that sounds like a lot. <laughs> it just sounds like a lot. <laughs> it was, it was a lot. And it, it, it added a different pressure to needing mm-hmm. to get the book done. And it meant that I was just in it. I was in it because I knew that I have this time and I cannot, I can't bump up against it. I'm not going to be on maternity leave working on this book. Um, But I lived with these women in a very isolated, very lonely couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so they became like my friends. I I just, I had this post, this wall in one of the bedrooms in my house and it was just Mm -hmm. covering post-its with different names of each character. Like they were just, I could have written four books about them. (laughs) As much joy as there is in the book, though, we need to talk a bit about the men. And that's not to say that there aren't some men who are great in this book and some that get great arcs, but also we have to talk about the misogyny. And certainly, you know, this is across all kinds of communities. It's certainly not limited to any one community. I want to be clear about that. But we have to talk about the bad stuff, too, because there is some stuff that happens in the book and it goes straight back to misogyny. And you keep a very clear eye on things. And some of it is, you know, hard to read, though I will say mama showing up when mama shows up next to the riverbank. Thank you, mama. Yeah. 
But yeah. for you as the writer, how are you balancing that? Because obviously you don't want to write a polemic, right? But yeah. we have to talk about the stuff that goes wrong in our communities. I couldn't look away from power mm -hmm. yeah. when writing this book. And although there are very few men that have a lot of page time, the ones that do, I needed to think about what are they doing? How are they either empowering, particularly within certain cultures, right? Sharing power, seeding power, or trying to assert power. That is the dynamic. That is how there is still a, a deference that can be paid in Dominican culture to men in a way that is hard to escape, right? And I, I, it would have been hard to hit a realistic note without acknowledging that especially the elder women are, were raised to to seed power, right? To men very often in, in, in maybe domestic capacities, but still, right? So that was important to have a handle on. I found it really hard yeah. to not have it just be this thing that was going to weigh down the novel. Mm -hmm. But the Dominican Republic has one of the highest femicide rates in the world right wow. now. That's, saying, that's saying, that is saying something. That is this their... This theory and yeah. dying. You know, there's a line where where it, I think it's, um, and not to give too much away, but Mila is talking and she's saying, you know, a man like him could disappear me and my death would not be as important as his status. And that's just it. Right. Some people are going to receive, uh, well, you have to do it for your reputation. And women just disappear. I get that it might be weighty, but it's also just uh, such a moment that needs to be captured on why it's important to tell our stories, why it's important to stand, mm -hmm. why it's important to make space for each other, because there is still this kind of danger in certain communities where if women don't hold each other and don't protect each other, we're being thrown to the wolves. Right. We can't pretend this isn't happening. No. Right? I'm not saying it's the only thing that defines us. I'm not saying it's the only thing that we have. No, right. But violence against women is real. And yes. violence against women that is not taken um, as seriously as it could or should be. And I think when we talk about the traumas that our, our elders may have experienced, mm -hmm they won't talk about yeah it might be important to acknowledge that it it often will be a kind of violence that is hard to name and that they have been taught shame around right and so what can the generation that maybe has a different relationship to shame and to to womanhood and feminism do in trying to bridge um forgiveness for oneself and trying to say mom i think you can forgive yourself you didn't do anything wrong Right. And it all comes back to the evolution of language, which we've essentially been taught. This entire episode is essentially about the evolution of language. <laughs> like, that's what you and I are talking about. Like, the fact that we even have conversations about shame or that we can say trauma, let alone generational trauma. Like, yes. I've got some older folks in my family where I'm like, yeah, they still can't say that phrase. And, you know, you're 80 and okay. But the way we've been able to change the conversation about family dynamics and what's acceptable and what's not and where we should speak up and where we shouldn't. I mean, I've seen so much change just in the space of my lifetime. Right. And I mean, I'm sorry, if you were alive in the nineties, we were all raised by wolves and like we were barbarians, like straight up. When you see some of this stuff, you're just like, what were we doing? This is horrible. What? So even in the span of like 20 years, right. We've been able, or 30 years, we've been able to make some. Yeah. Pretty significant strides forward. But at the same time, you're asking your parents and your grandparents and your aunties and your uncles to make adjustments that they might possibly just not have the language for. And I don't mean English versus whatever the language of origin oh, is. Yeah. I, I just straight up, you might not have the words. No, and it's can't. like, yeah. and then you've got 15 year olds who are like, bup, 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 and yeah, exactly how they want to define everything, which is great. And I would like to see everyone sort of get what they need emotionally but yeah, yeah language right language yeah. they yeah. have to be yeah, able exactly. to talk about this stuff and the mm -hmm. idea that you know women are seen as sort of objects more than people right and like who's seeing them and how yeah. are they being interpreted and who's protecting them yeah and, it, and it's also one of the reasons you know people often ask like why didn't Samuel appear in the book and I'm like no because of that like we're trying to get the stories we we wouldn't hear we're trying to get the folks who are often pushed to the back and aren't around the domino table telling their glory stories over and over again. Like that's who the book is about. It's not about the dudes. <laughs> yeah. And it's also how you end up leaving because in a lot of cases you don't get to leave. 
if there isn't something extraordinary that pushes you away from the community. Mm-hmm. And I think we have to remember that. I mean, we have sort of parts of the community, our community, our country, whatever, who get a little cavalier about the whole migrant thing and the way it's described. And I don't think it's an easy decision for anyone to say, let's pick up and go. And certainly not if you're facing sort of extraordinary circumstances, but you know, it's not like you're just walking to a desk at an airport and buying a plane ticket. You're not leaving. Is always a world, right. I mean, and you have to think about what, what leaving must have meant in the seventies and eight. I mean, prior to as well, I'm writing about folks who were leaving in the seventies and seventies, eighties and, you know, mid nineties where it there was no FaceTime. There was an internet. I mean, we had a calling card and my mom would call. And I remember this vividly because at the end you would get the, like, you have one minute left. And because I want to have to be disrupted mid conversation, my mom and my aunts would say, okay, it's time to just start laughing. Cause I want to make sure the call ends and I just hear you laughing. And they would just laugh until the phone clicked because that was, then that's how they closed every call. Like, okay, now it's time to just hear each other laughing. The last memory I have for you this week, I want to be one of joy, right? And that was when they, they all had phones, when it was the seventies and my mom is just writing letters that go out and like, you know, who knows when her mom is going to write her back. Like how hard is it to leave somewhere where you have nothing, you don't know where you're going to, but also your connection to what's, what's home has so much time and distance from when you, I, it's just, there's so much pain in the joy of, of those calls and, and so much. So they missed, they missed each other. Do you remember those pale blue airmail folds, you know, like the letters that you buy at the post office and you'd fold them because they were the lightest thing you, yeah. And I just remember my mom getting really excited when she saw Whatever those came in. Yeah. Or we would be traveling and she would like take a stack with her. And I'm like, yeah. oh, can you mail those from anywhere outside of the States, mom? I think I just, I think she needed to know that she, if she needed to drop a note, she could. Um, there were also a lot of postcards. I remember. If I need to reach my people, I can. Yeah. I and, you know, now it's funny because, you know, technology in some ways has helped us in many, many ways stay in touch yeah. in, you know, ways that we couldn't. But there is kind of this, I do miss letters. I really like... I think about this a lot and I'm like, I should actually write more letters to friends. And because it's so nice to just get a thing in the mail that's just, Mm -hmm. you know, simple and chatty. And and then I think about the rest of it. I'm like, yeah. (laughs) But I'll text you and say, happy birthday. Emoji, emoji, emoji. Right, right, right. right. I mean, I'm doing what I can. Hey, can we talk about literary influences for a second? Because you do have an MFA. You did teach for a while. You have all sorts of wonderful prizes for writers. And you've got some pretty great influences, Jason Reynolds, Jacqueline Woodson, Kiese Lehman, who I love. Can we just talk about some of the other writers who've sort of helped make you Elizabeth Acevedo, best-selling writer, teacher Ooh, of children? Yeah, I, I love talking about, you know, whose legacy I walk in. I think it's mm-hmm. so important to say the names of um, the writers that make you and and who I think have their fingerprints all over my work. And so. Uh, I always start with Lucille Clifton because I just yeah. think poet. There was so much I found in her work. The novel Family Lore actually opens with one of her poems, the first poem I ever read of hers, and her most famous poem, right? Which, if you're a poet, you're going to probably see it and be like, oh, she picked the poem in this poem. But but if you're not a poet, I think there's a lot that that poem offers. Um, yeah. It's what you celebrate with me. I read that and just fell in love with her and mm-hmm. then bought every book I could. And I was 16, like mm. reading the mm-hmm. best selected works, um, you know, Blessing of the Boat, Good Women, yep. like just dive into, into her work. So I love Lucy. I am a big fan of Jacqueline Woodson. I would say Red at the Bone really yes. um, influenced how I thought about time in family lore and how yep. time was going to be maybe more fluid. Mm-hmm. And in other books, the demarcation of time um, which ended up a little bit more demarcated than I imagined it would have. But mm-hmm. but that book really did some things with time that I love. Um, Disha Filia's uh, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies was a big influence for family lore. And like, how close can you get to the choices mm-hmm. that the radical and redemptive and yep. messy choices that women make, especially if they're being raised within a particular primness, right? Which I think is a, is a big part Peach of cobbler. 
Yes. You know, the story oh, I'm talking you about. Know, you know the story I'm talking about. I remember reading that story and just like, I just had so many things for how it was going to land. And I mean, she's fantastic. She's so good. She did it right. Yeah, Disha's, a, a, you know, incredible. Julia Alvarez, I would say, is a big influence. I loved Garcia Girls. I was really moved by um, In the Name of Salome, which is one of her lesser known works, but mm-hmm. about the first kind of prominent Dominican woman yep. poet. And then her, her novel Afterlife, which I got an early review copy in 2019. And so here's the story of four sisters mm-hmm. and, and how they're processing death, right? And I remember being in the middle of thinking through family lore and being like, oh, Julia and I are in conversation again, right? Of some folks that that I love. I, I mean, my friends, I'm really moved by the writers who I, who I write with. Okay, Safia Hello, who is an incredible poet and is writing about um, nostalgia and loss in Sudan and her parents and, um, and Blackness and, and what, what it means to try to make meaning of language and losing language and gaining language so I learned a lot from Safia Clint Smith right who was oh that guy is the best he (laughs) is the best I actually just bought a new copy of a book that he wrote an introduction it's it's a Ron Takaki history of America and yeah I I I already own a different mirror and then I saw that Clint had written an introduction I was like yep need that copy thank you yeah and he's such a good friend and he's a good critique partner you know I I have a lot of writer friends, but not everyone is a good reader of your work. And I think Sophia Clint are really good readers of my work. And I would say Naima Koster. Like those are the three that I I feel like get not only what I'm trying to do and what I'm working on, but they can see when they're like, you're not pushing enough. Like you're, you have more to go. And not every writer can say that and it'd be Mm -hmm. really cool, but I just trust them so much. And I like know if, you know, everything has to go through them before it goes to any editor because I need the kind of stamp of, all right, I think this was your best effort. Good job. <laughs> that is excellent. That oh. is, I, well, I love the idea of being in community too. I mean, this is, and I say this frequently, but reading is not a passive act. No, it's not a passive right. act. It's an active community. Writing mm-hmm. is not a passive act. It is an active community. And sure. because why would you do this if you don't want to connect? No, Yeah. And one of the things I love is honestly, you and I have different backgrounds, but I love reading you because I get these women or they're going to surprise me or I just like I can find the universal truth in the details of someone else's story because I'm a reader. Yeah. And I love that. I love that so much. And it's a treat. And I, you know, obviously I've bounced between your different formats, right? You've written a couple of novels as long form poetry. And then you have a couple of prose novels as well. And I'm just like, oh, okay. Okay. Just tell me a story. I'll follow you. Because yeah. ultimately for me, it's about voice. Yeah. And I think that stays consistent. Um, mm-hmm. The container changes and the container mm-hmm. is reflective of what yeah. the story needs. But but voice, I tried to, I think, tonally, even, even with this novel, which is for a different audience or for an audience that can kind of hold a lot of the complicated things we've talked about. Not that children can't, but this would have been a hard book for children. Oh, yeah, no, I'm I'm glad you switched. I think, I mean, I think it would be nice for younger readers who've enjoyed the earlier books, certainly to come to this a little later. I think sure. this is not something I would hand to a 15, even a mature 15 year old. I wouldn't, I think, you know, once you get into your early 20s, this would be really satisfying. It's certainly, <laughs> I'm certainly not in my early 20s and it was very satisfying, but I do think the short set should wait. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) there's a lot of work required of the reader. Yeah, be hard. It'd be work that might make it too unpleasurable for young readers. Yeah, and the subject matters are just. I wouldn't hand it to any child. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's the voice you know. I think it's the same handle of what I talk. I mean, a lot of what I talk about in my young adult novels just let a little bit more loosely and left for readers to hold more of the the story you have to bring more as a reader I think to yeah, this book I think any adult reader does that I think kids are getting there I think kids evolve over time to a point where they can bring their own experience to a book but although I tread gently there because part of how you started writing novels at all is because you had a class of eighth graders who were like Miss Acevedo we don't see ourselves in books why are you making us read this stuff 
And I love the idea. And I mean, certainly you're not the only writer who responds to I'm writing the thing that I didn't see on the shelf or I'm writing myself Mm -hmm. into the story. And I love that to bits. But I also think that the more people we can have writing their individual truth, right? Like the more we connect, the more we like, I don't need to read books that are solely about people like me. I need to read a good story about characters Mm -hmm. that I want to be involved with. And (laughs) these women. I know I keep coming and my eyes get really big and I get really excited, but these women, they're so great. <laughs> they're so, even when they're, um, even when, when they're not great, <laughs> there are a couple of aunties back in the TR that do not fall under the header of they're great. Sure. They are who they are. I don't see them being any different. I think they are products of their environment. They yeah. absolutely like they're who they are, but I would not like to share a meal with them. I would like to share a meal with the other women. (laughs) And it was interesting, right? Because those women don't get to tell their story firsthand. They don't. We don't know what made them. And the the only, there's one uh, matriarch who's somewhat redeemed, but she's redeemed by her daughters and her granddaughter, right? And so although you don't get her story because someone had a piece of it, Mm -hmm. because someone had an experience with her. And so it is a little bit of like, who we make monsters out of, especially when we don't have their side. But but also one of them was just a monster. <laughs> and I don't know that I'm getting her story. <laughs> yeah, but forgiveness gets complicated too, because I think, you know, there are some people who believe that you should just forgive because you should. <laughs> yeah. Forgiveness. I, I think you and I can have a whole separate conversation about forgiveness. <laughs> yeah, really... and how it works and doesn't work here. Yeah. And this, doesn't this work. Too, but it I, I I was watching, I can't remember what television show, and there was a therapist and she was saying there's a difference between resolution and reconciliation. Yes. And you, you can find resolution and not reconcile with someone, right? There's closure that can be had. And I think um, sometimes forgiveness is, is an answer that is maybe too easy if the person has not made the, done the work for you to share with them or you cannot reconcile with them, but you can say you are who you are and I'm stepping away. Um, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. Power is a piece of forgiveness that people don't really like to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Real. You know, in keeping <laughs> with all of the things we've been talking about in this episode and you know, we're bumping up against time and I knew we would, but can I ask what's next? Have you started thinking about the next thing? I have two things I'm juggling. And so this goes back to one of your your very early questions. I work on many things at once. Right? Whenever I finish a book, the odds are I'm working on something else because I get so anxious about the reception of a book that the only way I can move forward is like, I'm just going to do the next thing. So there's a YA novel that as of right now, looks like it's written in prose poetry. So they're okay. very short stylized sections about a young woman who recently released from an adjudicated youth center wearing an ankle bracelet who needs to go find her brother who's dealing with a mental health crisis um and kind of the choices you have to make about uh freedom right at its most literal sense but she's probably the most unlikable character i've ever written like she's just such a little smart ass and just like <laughs> just she is it's it's really something new to, okay. to sit with okay. this teen character who's like yo bro I just want to do my own thing right and she's different I read I write a lot of you know quote-unquote good girls and she's she's bucking that in a way I love I want to try my hand at an adult novel in verse and so I've been toying with a novel that is about black maternal health but it's also about ancestors and very literal the main character is in a coma while she is being delivered of a child and she meets an ancestor. So we will see what all of this is. Okay. But you get you were the first person to, to hear any of, of this. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. Elizabeth Acevedo, thank you so much for joining us on Port Over. Family Lore is out now. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We have a couple of great books to recommend for this special double shot episode. I'm Mark coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by my book buddy, Mary. Hi, Mary. How are you? Hi, I'm joining you all from Beaumont, Texas. So we've got a couple of fantastic books to uh, recommend. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in with a recommendation for Esmeralda Santiago's novel. This is a book that I was thinking a lot about 
uh, family stories, uh, specifically Latinx families, and uh, very well told uh, kind of sweeping dramas. And there's a book that I read recently that I just can't quite get out of my head, which is always a good sign. And that is Lotteria. It's by Mario Alberto Zambrano, and it is a stunner. This is a story of a family that unfolds through the journal entries of an 11-year-old girl named Luz. Uh, she begins the novel as a ward of the state. Uh, she is not speaking. Her father was just incarcerated. And we find out through her journal entries how we got to this place. The Book structure, I think, is very brilliant. Um, Lotteria is a Mexican card game. Think like bingo meets tarot, sort of, where there are images on each card. Uh, and these images are what is prompting Luz to write these journal entries. It spurs on a memory that allows her to quickly jot down um, something that has happened very recently. So as the book progresses, we get bits and pieces throughout different areas of time that sort of build onto this lovely and sobering family story. The copy I have even has like rounded edges, kind of like a deck of cards. It is gorgeous. It's just a moving collection of vignettes that really shape into this lovely tapestry that really talks about the Mexican-American experience in uh, very important ways. So please, please check out Lotteria by Mario Alberto Zambrano. Mary, what do you have for us? So my TBR top off pick with Elizabeth Acevedo's book in mind is The Shoemaker's Wife by Adriana Chijani. It definitely has a multi-generational family story to it. So when the book starts off, uh, we are in Italy at the turn of the 20th century, and we meet Cyril and Enza. And Cyril and Enza meet under tragic circumstances. They meet this one time, and then they go their separate ways. And the story follows Cyril and Enza as they uh, immigrate to the United States at different times. And they finally get both get to New York City. And Cyril is a shoemaker's apprentice. And Enza is the seamstress. And she eventually ends up working for the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And so they finally meet again. And what follows is this great epic love story and how hard families have to work to put themselves back together together after trauma and um no spoilers or anything like that but it's loosely based on the author's own grandparents their immigration and their love story so my pick is the shoemaker's wife by adriana trajani fantastic book nice choice i like that you picked something that still feels rooted in family epic and immigrant story just mm -hmm. fantastic nice work but guess what that's all we have for today Thanks so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. I'm Mary. You can follow my home store at BN Beaumont TX. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. Port Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.